morning, folks. Very, very warm welcome to Ellen Parish Church this morning. My name is Alistair Bruce, and I'm the minister here in Ellen Parish Church. It's lovely to be here with you for our time of worship. Um, if this is your first time with us, then you're most, most welcome um, here. Um, if, it's, if this is your um, millionth, hundredth time uh, here, see you, Hannah, um, then, uh, then you're most welcome as well. Um, over the summertime, we have been uh, uh, looking at heroes of the faith, and then after that, in the late summer, we've been uh, going through a series called Whole Life Worship, which is to do with how we connect the worship that we do in church with the worship that we do outside of church when we are in our normal, in inverted commas, lives. Um, we are... Uh, we're coming to the end of that series this week. Um, next week, we have the Girls' Brigade and Boys' Brigade dedication service um, and the 140th anniversary of the BB, so we're celebrating that next week. The week after that will be Harvest, and then we're on to another series into the autumn. So, um, you can mark your diaries um, uh, accordingly. Um, our children and young folks have been doing a series on um, adventuring with Jesus or adventures with Jesus, and um, I am thinking, who is telling? Eddie is telling that story um, this morning. You don't have to do anything just now, Eddie. This is, I saw that look of panic. <laughs> uh, so Eddie's going to come and tell us that story later on. Um, I forgot to tell you that we have cameras in the church to, uh, to record the service so that we can upload it onto Facebook and YouTube later on. It won't go up today. It will go up tomorrow because I don't have time to edit it um, today, so it'll need to be done tomorrow morning. Um, but if you're not comfortable with cameras and all of that stuff, then please um, stick uh, near the back for that. But I think that's all I need to tell you um, at the moment. Our Star Squad seniors are following the same theme as the adults as well. So they've been thinking about whole life worship and they're going to think a little bit more about that this morning. But before we do all of that, let's take a little moment to still our hearts as we approach God in worship. It started with God. He had the first word. In the beginning, he was. He started, we followed. He initiated, we responded. He invited, we answered. He loved. First of all, he loved. He loved us first so that we could love. So let us respond to that love in worship as we sing together our first two hymns, hymn number 197 in the purple hymn books, or it'll come up on the screen behind me. Come now is the time to worship, and then as we gather, which is the new song that we've been singing over the course of this series.
So there's just a couple of intimations, a couple of announcements and things that are going on just to remind you of, to draw your attention to. Uh, we'll be mentioning over the last uh, maybe week or so that we are um, uh, setting up to run a bereavement course. So um, a course that's called the Bereavement Journey is for people who have been bereaved um, recently or, or some time ago um, and who maybe feel like they want a wee bit more support or might want to explore what grief means and how grief affects you uh, in, in a bit more detail and to do that with, uh, with a group of people. So it's a six, it's a seven week course with an optional seventh week. So six weeks with an optional seventh week, although people tend to stay for the seventh one, which, is, uh, which talks about faith. There's nothing in the first six weeks that talks about faith, but the seventh one um, is, uh, uh, talks about faith issues uh, to do with bereavement. 
I'm going to show you a, a, a video that, uh, that kind of promos it, that tells you a, a little bit about it. It has people who are talking about their grief um, and talking about, uh, about folks who have died. So just to let you know that, that, uh, that folks will talk about that um, to begin with, and I'll tell you a wee bit more about the course. son, Addy, um, 25 years ago now. He was only three, three and a half. He, he died of viral myocarditis. My brother and my father died in Hong Kong during the pandemic. I have had multiple bereavements. I lost my mom to alcoholism, my dad later on, my sister to suicide, and my husband suddenly. I've lost a number of colleagues uh, to sudden death. I have had a miscarriage at around 10 weeks, and I've also experienced losing my baby at 28 weeks, and she was still born. My husband died of cancer. It was a long, horrible illness. My grandfather in 2000, um, my father in 2008, grandmother in 2020, and my aunt in December 2020. Welcome to the bereavement journey. I'm Reverend Cassius Francis. I've been involved in helping churches to run the bereavement journey for a while now. And I'm here with my colleagues, Jane Ungen and Yvonne Richmond Tullock. Our aim over these weeks is to provide a safe place where our guests can take time out to understand where they are and to explore their loss. Loss is a natural part of life, which it's necessary for us to work through for our well-being. And our hope is that over the coming weeks, our guests will dare to face one of the hardest things that anyone can go through, the death of someone important to them, and work through what that means for them, and find ways to cope for a good and healthy future. Anyone who feels they haven't had the opportunity to grieve someone special in their life, it's never too late to do good grief work, even many years after someone has died. Janet and I uh, did a course this week in preparation for this. You have to be a registered church to be able to run uh, the bereavement course. Uh, and uh, Janet and I did, uh, did the course uh, that, uh, that you need to do in order to uh, start running it. And some of the statistics about the lack of work on grief and the huge amount of mental ill health there is around grief are quite astounding and quite staggering and much, is a much greater um, issue than I had originally thought. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're doing uh, this course. One of the other ones is that we just felt that, that as a church we should do more to support people who have been bereaved and who are, uh, who are grieving, uh, not just in our church but, uh, but throughout the whole community. So the idea is to be able to roll this uh, course out to the community, to, uh, to anybody who has uh, been bereaved and is, and is dealing with grief. So we're going, to, uh, we're going to start this first course on the 30th of October um, on a Monday afternoon. So it'll be about 2 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Um, and uh, and we'll, we'll try that one as a pilot um, uh, with the hope of, be, of running another, uh, another course in the new year um, at a different time. Um, and we'll see how we get on uh, with that. But if you'd like some more information about that, then you can come and speak to me at the end. We'll stick up some posters about it. Um, and if you know of anybody who you think would, uh, would benefit from that, then please uh, let them know as well. 
Um, we've also been promoing. Um, this is like the one show where you have to segue from something serious into something more light-hearted. Um, we've been doing the uh, uh, promoing the uh, auction of promises. Elaine, do you want to say anything about the auction of promises? Uh, yeah. <laughs> So just you'll be fed up seeing me, but just to remind you, it's uh, Friday the 17th of November. I've put um, some sheets at the back of the church this morning, which are the promises that were put up for offer last time. Just to give you some suggestions, thank you to those who have already been in contact. Um, we've got a few in already. And the more we have, the better, the greater the variety, the better. Um, the tickets will be available soon. Um, they're three pounds, and for that you're getting your wine, your nibbles, and your tea and your coffee. Um, if the tickets will be available in the church and also at the, the Kirk Centre office. It's just to give us an idea for catering. Um, when you arrive on the night, you'll get a little wooden spoon, which will have a number on it, and that'll be your number for bidding. Um, other than that, if you have any questions, come and see me. My email address is on the order of service, um, and I'll do anything I can to help and you'll be fed up hearing about it, but please come along. It'll be a nice social event, there'll be entertainment. And if you can't come on the night, don't worry, there'll be a chance to bid in advance. Thank you. If you can't come on the night, we'll get you anyway. That's the way, that's the way. Um, so three pounds for, uh, for entertainment and for, for the wine and nibbles and all of that stuff. I, I can't say it better than that. Um, the drama group meets uh, every Wednesday in the upper room at half past seven for fellowship, singing, fun and friendship. So come along to that if you are able. Um, and the choir uh, meets this Thursday um, for their practice as well. But I don't think there's any other meetings or anything else I need to tell you about. Don't see anything. Connect, thank you, thank you. We have Connect tonight, our evening service uh, tonight, a uh, kind of contemporary music reflection um, prayer discussion um, is on tonight at seven o'clock. You come a wee bit earlier, then you get tea and coffee, um, but uh, we'll aim to start round about seven at uh, the back of seven. And I see James poised to bring our offering forward. So let's do that now. James, thank you. Let's pray together. O Lord, giver of life, source of freedom, we know that all we have received is from your hand. You call us to be stewards of your abundance, the caretakers of all you've entrusted to us. Help us to always use your gifts wisely and teach us to share them generously. May our faithful stewardship bear witness to the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen. And now Eddie is going to come and tell us the story of the two houses. Right, so, legs nice and wide apart. Right. right, are you ready? And what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called the hinge. Right, so you're ready, right? And we're just going to go forward. And that's it. And that's where your legs spread apart. Dear me. Right, and stand back up. That's a dodge. Now, what I do is take a little step forward. So, let me introduce you to something. This is my left leg. Say hello, Eddie's left leg. Eddie's left leg is doing all the work, and Eddie's going to do the same thing. But the only thing on the ground is going to be Eddie's left leg. So everybody behind me is going, I hope this is safe. But you ready? I'm going to go. Superb. That's the hinge. That's great. Now, now that we're warmed up, we should go need a story that has a wee bit to do about having a stable base. Magnet. Super magnet. Super magnet. <laughs> right. In case we need magnets. Right, you hold that. Okay, so let us get round. Right, you hold that for a second. Well, Eddie gets ready. Thank you, Kindy Paul. Right. The two houses. 
Jesus was telling a story. Everyone was listening. They were out in the hillside close to the lake. Once upon a time, there were two men. One man said, I want to build a house. I'll build it on the rock. That's a good, safe place to build a house. So he dug and he dug down to the rock and he built his house there. Then the rain came. And then the wind blew. And then the floods came. But his house... But his house stood safe on the rock. If you listen to me and do as I say, Jesus said, you are like that man. The other man said, I want to build a house. I'll build it on the sand where it's easy, easy to dig. So his house was soon built. And then the rain came, and the wind blew, and the floods and his house fell down with a crush. It is as long as you can find your place. Oh, found it. If you listen to me. But forget what I say, Jesus said. You are like that man. Jesus' special friend sat close as he told them the secrets of God's kingdom. God blesses the people who know that they need him. They belong to God's kingdom. God blesses those who are sad. He will comfort them. God blesses those who want to do right. He will give them what they want. God blesses those who mend quarrels. They will be called God's children because they are like him. Need three hands for this. Oh. Long ago, Jesus said, God told us his people the best way to live. This is what you must do. Love your enemies, just not your friends. Be kind to everyone and share. Do you, are you kind to everyone and share? Good. Be nice to... That's, yeah, no, don't share food. Uh, be nice to other... Pe- just don't tell anybody. Be nice to other people as you want them to be to you. For God takes care of everyone, nice and nasty, good and bad. And the hot sun shone on the blue lake. The wild flowers and the grass glowed bright as jewels. Birds hopped close, hoping for crumbs. But the grown-ups were worried. They didn't have much money. What are we going to eat? The children are hungry. What are we going, what are we, and what are we going to wear? Our clothes are worn out. They just couldn't stop worrying. Does your hair make a sound when you do that? Will we listen to it? No? All right, fair enough. There's no need to worry, (laughs) Jesus said to them. Just look around you. God gives the bird their food. And see those flowers, God. Could anyone have more beautiful clothes? If God looks after the birds and the flowers, he's sure to look after you. You matter so much more to him. Forget your worries, love God, and do what he wants. And God will give you what you really need. Did you like that? Right, have I lost my phone? Right, so you want to hold that for a second? need to be louder and louder. You get your own microphone. Now let us pray. Now I am eight. I am? I'm eight. I am eight. I, there's a few decades to add on to the front of that, but I am eight. Right? I used to like you. But anyway, let, no, no, less of the disrespect in it. This, I'm going to read a prayer that was written by an eight-year-old. To be fair, she's not eight anymore. But this is a genuine prayer written by an eight-year-old sometime in 2004 when she was in primary four. So are we listening to just a little prayer? Our dear Lord, 
who has made the whole wide world and watches over us from heaven. Thank you for all you have given us and for the food that we eat. We ask you, Lord, to help put an end to all the wars that are going on and the violence that some people do to others. Help those who are in prison to see what they have done. Lord, please keep us safe. Amen. Thanks, prayer. Right. Now, do we want to all say the family prayer? Are you ready? No, I'm fine. Are you ready? Okay. Nice and loud. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. Right, now you are going to sing a song called The Wise Man Built. Appropriate response. I know this. the children to go next door now and the young people for Twinkle Stars and Star Squad so even if you're visiting today you're very welcome to go and join in it's through the door on your left follows us into every day, your goodness poured out. With softened hearts we know your blessing and change the world around. Let's pray together. Loving God, as we come to consider what it is that you want to say to us this morning, we pray that you be in our minds and in our hearts. 
that you open our minds to hear what it is that you want to say to us this morning, that you open our hearts to receive from you. Holy Spirit, as you move around this place, surround us, settle on us, move within us to hear from you. So, loving God, may words spoken be your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At 7.51 a.m. on Friday the 12th of January 2007, in the middle of the morning rush hour, and just inside the entrance of the metro station in Washington, D.C., a young man opened a violin case, took out the violin, and started playing. 1,097 people passed him by over the 45 minutes that he played. 27 of those people gave him some money. Only seven actually stopped to listen for any length of time. One of the ones who paid most attention was a three-year-old boy, and his mother hurried him along uh, to get to wherever it was that they were going. And as she hurried him along, the boy turned to keep watching and keep looking at the man who was playing the violin. Other children did the same thing. All of the parents forced their children past and on. In, in, in the just over three quarters of an hour that the man played, he took in 42 pounds and 18 pence. Well, in, in dollars, but I did the exchange. When he finished playing, silence took over. No one noticed it. No one applauded. There was no recognition whatsoever of what he had done. Why should there be? It's just a busker playing in a metro station in Washington City. People had other things to do and other places to be. Well, maybe not all was as it seemed. Of the six pieces that the man performed, two were from Bach, one from Massenet, one from Schubert, one from Pons. Among the bits that he played was one of the most intricate violin solos ever written. The violin that he played was a 1713 Stradivarius worth $3.5 million. The busker's name was Joshua Bell, and two days previously, he had sold out a theater down the road for seats costing $100 or more. What happened was not an impromptu idea. What happened wasn't a fluke. It was an experiment that was put, put together by the Washington Post as part of an experiment about perception, taste, and the priorities of people. And the conclusions that you can draw and that, that people have drawn from that experiment are vast and varied. This is an actual picture of, uh, of Joshua Bell playing in the Washington, D.C. Um, subway. The, um, the conclusions from the experiment are vast and varied from our inability to see beauty when it is staring us in the face. Or perhaps you could draw a conclusion that nobody's actually, re actually interested in virtuoso violin pieces and they just didn't want to hear what was being played. Especially late in the morning when you're late for a train and there's coffee to be bought and there's meetings to go to and all of those kinds of things. All sorts of conclusions you could draw. Simply, maybe the simplest conclusion that we could draw from it is just that people missed the point of what it was that he was doing because they weren't really expecting a classically trained virtuoso um, violinist to be playing in their morning commute. Our expectations play a huge role in how we see things, how we appreciate things, how we react to the world around us. Our expectations play a huge part in how people react to us. For example, if I went into Annie's tea room down on Market Street and expected to buy a three-quarter inch drive socket with a three millimeter head, 
then not only would I be really disappointed, but Annie herself, when I complained that I couldn't buy that in the tea room, would say, it's not really what a tea room's for. Or if I went to the Aberdeen Arts Center and expected to browse all of the second-hand electric cars that are on the market there, and if I questioned the owner about why he didn't have a whole lot of second-hand cars for me to have a look at, then the owner would say, well, you've somewhat missed the point of what the art center is here for. And I would be disappointed, and he would be kind of irritated with me. Equally, if I took on my day off, if I took my book to Hoodle Soft Play Center in Old Meldrum and expected to sit in the play barn and have a nice, quiet, peaceful time reading my book for an hour, I would be disappointed by the lack of peace that there would be in Hoodle's play center. And if I complained to the manager about the lack of peace there was in Hoodle's soft play center, they would say, you have somewhat missed the point of a soft play center, and what are you doing here without a child, you weird person? Now, it's absurd that we would ever do anything like that, and people would question our sanity if we started to do things like this. But the thing is that we often come to worship with the same kind of mindset. We come to worship in the same way. We have an expectation of what we'll find in worship that is different to what it is we're actually doing in worship. So I might have an expectation that worship is in a specific place, it's at a specific time, it's in a specific style, it uses specific gadgets and devices, and will have a specific atmosphere. I might have this expectation when I come. I might expect it to be really dull and boring. And if I come to those if I come to worship with those kinds of expectations, if those are the biggest things in my mind, then I'm going to be disappointed, or maybe I'll be very excited if I thought it was going to be boring, and then it's not. But I'll be disappointed if I come expecting all of those things as the biggest point in my mind, because I've missed the point. Now, to be clear, I'm not taking a pot shot at any specific style of worship over another. If I come to worship expecting that everything is played on guitars and drums, then I'm missing the point. If I come expecting that it'll always be quiet and reflective or all agey or happy clappy or any of these kinds of things, then equally I'm missing the point. That goes for every age as well. Our young people come expecting that they'll come in, hear a couple of songs, endure those, endure me uh, waffling on about the, about the intimations. They'll hear a story and then they'll go through to their activities. That's what they expect. And when we don't do that, then they are incandescent about what's going on. And next week when we have the GB and BB service, they will be like that because that's what they expect and that's not what they're gonna get next week. They're missing the point. Now, their excuse is that they're learning how to worship and they're learning about God. As adults, we, of course, know better. Coming to worship and expecting a certain style or format is as much missing the point as going to Annie's tea room and expecting to buy a socket set, going to the art center and expecting to buy a secondhand car, and going and having a peaceful read at Hoodles. Because the point of worship is and always is God. The point of worship is God. And every time the point of worship is God. God is the center of our worship and the whole reason for our worship. Everything else that we do in church is peripheral. Everything else is secondary. God is center. Earlier in our sermon series, we explored the background to the church in Ephesus. Remember that this was the church that Paul was encouraging to stand up against the culture that was going on round about it, against the culture of that city. Remember that the city is heavily based, um, the, the culture of the city was heavily based on and influenced by the worship of the goddess Artemis, or her Roman name was Diana. There was a huge temple in Ephesus that was built to celebrate the glory of the goddess 
Artemis and was one of the ancient, the seven ancient wonders of the world. The economy and the culture of Ephesus was built around the worship of this goddess Artemis. And we explored that a few weeks ago in Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. But there is another letter to the church in Ephesus. There's a much smaller letter to the church in Ephesus that's hidden away in the Bible, because you'll know, if you've been in, 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 in church for any length of time, you'll know that there's not a second Ephesus letter. There's, a, there's another letter, though, hidden away in a obscure bit of the Bible that we find right at the end of the Bible, and people tend to no, not go anywhere near this part of the Bible because it's weird, and it's complicated, and it's a bit freaky, and we don't really like to go there. And so, this morning, we're going to go there. We're going to delve into, very briefly, the murky world of the book of Revelation. And we're going to find out in the book of Revelation what happened to the church in Ephesus, or what was going on in the church in Ephesus, and how the church in Ephesus was missing the point. And Roz is going to come up and read that for us just now. Good morning. Our reading this morning is from Revelations chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And you can find this in the Church Bible on page 1234. To the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Thanks be to God for his reading. So the book is officially called The Revelation of Jesus. If you look at the start of the, of the book of Revelation, it's called The Book of the Revelation of Jesus, and it was written by a man called John. Now, biblical thinkers don't really know, or they're not entirely sure which John it was who wrote the book of Revelation. There could be two Johns. It could be John, who's known as the beloved disciple, who wrote the Gospel of John, could be that John. Or there was another John who was a teacher and a prophet who traveled around during the, that kind of area of the churches during that time of the early church. But the opening of the, of, the, of the book of Revelation, of the book of the Revelation of Jesus, makes it really clear, John makes it really clear what kind of writing this is. He calls it a revelation or an apocalypse. Now, a revelation or an apocalypse is a very specific type of literature. It's a very specific type of Jewish literature that we don't really have in our kind of English, in our, in our kind of Western world type of writing. It's a very odd uh, bit of writing that we don't really have much um, about. If you look up the dictionary um, uh, to see what the meaning of the word apocalypse is, then it'll say two things, more or less. It says, number one, the complete final destruction of the world as described in the biblical book of Revelation, or 
number two, an event involving destruction or damage on a catastrophic level, both of which is really unhelpful and both of which isn't really quite what the book of Revelation is all about. So, if you look up the dictionary, then um, jettison that. It's not really what the book of Revelation is about. It doesn't really help us understand what's going on here. But John's readers, the early, the first readers of this book, they would understand what an apocalyptic type of writing was. They would get this kind of literature, and so they would have much more of a body of understanding of what was going on here than we do now. So, for example, the book of Daniel, the book of Ezra, and the book of, of, um, um, of Ezekiel in the Bible are all apocalyptic books. If you read the end of Daniel, it gets kind of weird and freaky um, at the end of it, um, and that's the apocalyptic part of it. What actually apocalyptic writing is all about, what John is meaning, and what his early readers would have understood is that this kind of writing is massively symbolic, and it's really taken from a dream or a vision that seems to be God's perspective on history, on the history of the world, viewed in light of history's final outcome. I'll say that again. What apocalyptic writing is, is it's a highly symbolic vision or dream that seems to show God's perspective on the world viewed in light of history's final outcome. So, in other words, John is seeing a dream from God at the end of time that's commenting on life now. My dad used to have a phrase, I'm sure that he would still use it if he was doing a lot of DIY, um, but uh, my dad had a phrase growing up uh, that, he would call, that he would say when any, anybody, usually me, commented on a half-finished DIY job or a half-finished job fixing the car or something like that. And he would say this, he would say, fools and bairns shouldn't see a job half done. Because I would be saying, well, why are you doing that there? And what about that? And why is that not happening? And he would say, fools and bairns shouldn't see a job half done. My dad had a vision of what the final outcome would be. And so he knew in the middle of it what was going on and what was happening. He knew how it would more or less turn out. And so he knew in the middle of things what was happening. The book of Revelation is a little bit like that. It's a little bit like God's version of that. He's giving us, as people who only see kind of part, of part of the world, a version of how things, a vision of how things will turn out in the end. God is standing at the end of time talking about something that's going on in the middle of time, but He knows what's going to happen in the end. Practically, this book was written by John, who was exiled on the island of Patmos. He is writing this dream or this vision that he got from God um, to seven churches in the Asia Minor area of the world. And he's commenting through this vision and dream, he's commenting on what's going on in these churches at this point into their specific times and situations. The reason that it's seven churches is that seven is a really significant number in Jewish literature. It's a really symbolic significant number, and the number seven signifies completeness. So, it's taken from the seven days of creation and rest, um, so seven is completeness. So, you'll hear when Ross read, talked about seven lampstands um, and seven churches and all of those kind of things, seven is really symbolic, means completeness. Throughout the whole of the book, the number seven is used to signify certain things. And we're not going to go into that today, you'll be pleased to know. Generally, when we look at Scripture, when we look at the Bible, we take, take a meaning out of it that is for ourselves for today. We read the Bible, we say, what does that mean for me uh, today? And how do we live our lives accordingly? 
But we also need to make sure that we root what it is that we're thinking about back in the context of when that bit of writing was written. And so for this book, for the book of Revelation, this book is full of symbols and odd language, so it's even more important that we contextualize it. It's even more important that we understand the symbolism of what's going on in the book. So before you, before you ever read Revelation, you kind of need to, need to do a whole lot of looking um, at, uh, at the symbolism of it. And that's actually what John uh, expects his readers to do, is to see the symbolism and then go and find those bits in the rest of the Bible so that they can read the book in context. So John is writing to seven churches with this dream or this vision from God. One of the seven churches that John is writing to is the church in Ephesus. And in his letter, through this vision that he's received from God, he tells the Ephesian church that they've worked hard, that they've stood firm in the face of persecution. Persecution of Christians was rife under the emperor Nero in Roman times and was going to be just as bad under the next emperor, Domitian. Um, so, the, so Christians were under a lot of persecution at that time. And so he encourages them that they've stood firm in their faith. But he also warns the Ephesian church that although they've done well, they have forgotten one thing. And John writes this. He says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So the Ephesian church had stood firm in their faith. They'd been getting all the jobs done of being church, but it seems like they've missed the point of why they were there. They've forgotten that the heart of what they're to do as a church, they've forgotten that the heart of the gospel is love. Now, it's not actually clear from the letter whether they've forgotten to love God, whether they've forgotten to love the people in their church, or whether they've forgotten to love their neighbors. It doesn't make that clear in the letter, but most people think that it's all three. Because loving God, loving our church, loving our neighbors, well, that's pretty much all loving God together. So, it's probably all three that they've forgotten to do. But simply put, they've forgotten that they're supposed to love. And John goes on in his vision to explain what the church is supposed to do. And he says this, repent and do the things you did at first. So John's saying to the church in Ephesus, the first thing that you did was love, and that's what you need to go back, and that's what you need to do. You need to firstly love God love people, love neighbors. Former Bishop of Durham, a New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright, explains that in an early Christian sense, love was an action. Love was something tangible. Love was something that you did. He says this, he says, giving hospitality and practical help to those in need, that was the chief mark of the early church. No other non-ethnic group had ever behaved like this. The, the, the defining mark of this group of Christians was the fact that they loved more than everybody else. That was their chief mark. But it seems like they've lost that along the way. It seems that the Ephesian church, through their persecution and their encouragement to not follow the culture that was going on at the time, they had forgotten to love people. And that was the most important part of the gospel. They had forgotten that God loved them so much that, had he, that he had become a human being to show humanity how to live and to give his life on a Roman cross and to wipe away all of the ways that we mess up the world and our relationships. They had forgotten this amazing love was what was underpinning their faith. And it seems that they've grown comfortable in their existence and they had forgotten God's sacrifice in Jesus. And friends, it's really easy to do that, to forget what it is that we're actually here for. It's really easy to put our own needs and our own wants as a church and as individuals first and last as well. N.T. Wright explains it like this. He says, the Ephesian church needed to wake up to remember how things used to be, to repent and get back on track. I read a story this week about an incident that happened in a church. 
Apparently, the offering was being brought forward to the front, and a little boy was really inspired by all that he had heard in the service so far, and he wanted to give an offering, but he didn't have anything to give. So he sat in his chair, and he watched as the basket was brought to the front, and he longed to be able to give something to the God that he had heard about and the God that he loved. So he got from his seat, and he walked to the front of the church, and he took the basket off the communion table, um, and he tried to get in. Now, the elders of the church didn't want their basket of lovely offerings to be squished by this boy, and the mum was, of course, affronted that, uh, that this would happen. And she took him away from it and scolded him and said, this is not a play area, sit down and be quiet and dragged him back to his seat. As they sat in their seats and as the mum questioned her wee boy about what on earth he thought he was doing, she suddenly began to realize that she had missed the point of what he was doing. The boy wasn't actually being badly behaved as they had thought because the boy explained, I didn't have anything to give to God, so I was giving him myself. I think that's what gets us back on track. Sacrificial love, giving ourselves to God. And I think that's what brings us full circle back to where we started this whole series off. In his letter to the Romans, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, This is your true and proper worship. To not miss the point of worship and of being the church is to give ourselves to God in all we do. It means that worship isn't what we do here on a Sunday, although that's part of it. Worship is everything that we do. Everything that we do that is done in the love of God is worship. The simple act of caring for a grandchild is worship. The simple act of driving your car with respect for other road users is an act of worship. Doing your job in a way that helps the lives of your colleagues is an act of worship. Making a simple cup of coffee for someone is an act of worship. Even smiling at somebody as you walk down the street Letting somebody go in front of you in a queue, giving up your seat on the bus is an act of worship when it's done in response to God's love and mercy. And it's when all these little things, these little acts of worship come from a place of love, that's when the church becomes bigger and bolder and so much more exciting than somewhere that you just turn up to out of duty once a week or once a month. It becomes everything that we do. It becomes everywhere we are. And church becomes your whole life, and worship becomes your whole life. So, may we go from this place to love and to live our whole lives as worship. Let's pray together. Loving God, for your sacrifice on the cross, we thank you. For all you've given to us, we thank you. For our lives, we thank you. And so as we offer those back to you as a simple act of worship, we pray that the Holy Spirit would inspire us, strengthen us, and lead us this and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, As the band come up to uh, lead us in our time of response, um, I'm going to give you a quick postscript, um, and uh, I'm going to just lift the veil above uh, uh, on on how I kind of work out sermons and such like. There's a point usually in a sermon where, where there's like three different ways that I can go. Um, in the sermon, and I, and I chose to go 
the kind of personal way this morning. I could have chosen, and I actually went this way for a little while and then deleted it all. Um, but I could have gone, so, gone and talked about the church. Um, and I could have gone and talked about the church because um, if, you, if you look for a church in Ephesus nowadays, you can't find one. There is no church left in Ephesus. You can find archae archaeological uh, um, remains of the church, but there is no living, active church in Ephesus anymore. And I wonder what that tells us about our church, about the Church of Scotland, about who we are as a church, that the church in Ephesus were warned, and the legacy is that there is no church there anymore. I wonder what that tells us about how we live as a church. So that's in 30 seconds what the last seven minutes of the sermon it could have been, and I just thought it was so interesting that I wanted to tell you about it. Our response this morning, our response this morning, how can we show love uh, to people? How can we show love to, uh, to those outside? Well, um, you can encourage people. That's one way of doing that. And so I have, um, I've got slightly less than I thought because they're a little bit bigger than, than I thought they were in the box. Um, I've got mints. Um, and so the response is come forward, take a mint, um, take it away and give it to somebody who you would like to encourage for some reason. Maybe it's somebody that's been really kind to you. Maybe it's somebody that, you've, uh, that, uh, that, that has helped you. Maybe it's somebody that you just feel needs a wee bit of encouragement. So come forward, take, uh, take one of these mints away with you and give it to that person. Pray before you do it um, to think about who it is that you would like to, um, to, uh, to come and do this. These are encourage mints. <laughs> Let's worship. the words of my mouth and the thoughts of my heart bless your name bless your name jesus and the deeds of the day and the truth in my way speak of you speak of you
loving God, we thank you that uh, we can go from this place to encourage, to bring your love um, in, uh, in any small way um, to those um, who need it. And so we pray that each of these um, little tokens would bring some love into someone's life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we're going to continue our worship singing together the hymn, The House of God, which you'll not know the words, but you should know the tune well enough. The house of God is our delight Its faith is strong, its future bright Where doors and hearts are open wide And those with ears of those outside The house of God is built on rock Jesus and Peter, Abraham stock And saints and angels who surround Oh, for whom Christ is solid ground Oh, for whom Christ is solid ground church. Let's pray together today. Thank you for loving our world, for sending your son, Jesus, the sinless one, who paid, uh, who died to pay the price for all our sins, yet death could not hold him, and he rose again, showing he has the power to forgive our sins, the way to eternal life and joy bringing us back into relationship with you, our God. This is our good news, and we want to share it with our world. What amazing grace. We pray for our world with conflicts, economies that are struggling and the cost of living. We're a world that's in need, and we pray for those who are suffering through the wars, the famines, the oppression and any disasters. Father, let them know your provision, your protection, your power, your peace, your hope. We pray that you would unite families that are separated and that you would comfort those who mourn. And bless the local churches in these regions so they can help those that are suffering. Help our world leaders to work together, not for selfish gain or ambition, 
but for the benefit of those who cannot help themselves. Bring a conviction to them so they do what is right, so they love mercy, and so they lead with humility. And help us play our part so we can give abundantly with joy in our hearts. Let us be good stewards of all you have entrusted to us. And for our nation, we pray for our leaders who work to make all our countries a better place for all, for those who work on behalf of the oppressed, for those facing or living in poverty. Give our leaders strength and wisdom and help them to do all they can to support those who need it the most. And for our church, bless our church. Bring a wealth of talent, gifts, and finance, and help us to bless others that are in need, especially those who are grieving. Bring them comfort. Show them compassion. Show them how much you care for them, Father. And for the prayers we have in our hearts, we bring them to you now. Help us to trust you. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you, especially when we find ourselves in the storm. And finally, for our leaders, for our volunteers, and especially for Alistair, Nicola, James, and Daniel. They're such a gift to us. Help us to support the vision they have for our church, to reach out into our community with love, with compassion, with kindness. Give them wisdom and strength to fulfill the plans that you have for us as a church in this place. Bless them today and bless them tomorrow. Grant them the desires of their hearts and fill them so their cup overflows. When they need your encouragement, send your word quickly to build them up. Send your spirit to speak and send your people to support in practical and spiritual ways. Guard them, put a hedge of protection all around them, and remind them of Psalm 91. You will save those who love you, and will protect those who acknowledge you as Lord. And when they call to you, you will answer them. When they are in trouble, you will be with them. You will rescue them and honor them. You will reward them with long life. You will save them. And now to him who sits on the throne and to Jesus, the lamb, our solid ground, we say blessing, honor, glory, and might forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Richie. Uh, so if you're able to stick around at the close of the service, then there is tea and coffee and uh, cakes and all sorts of things uh, for you to uh, uh, eat um, or drink. Um, there's our save a loaf, uh, the food that would end up in landfill and various uh, places you can take that away or give a donation and take all of that away. I see a lot of broccoli for some reason. So, uh, so if you like broccoli, then, uh, then take that away um, with you. Uh, our, um, our new elders, um, we are making new elders soon. Um, and our new elders are meeting after the service this morning for their first kind of get together and have a, having a chat about being an elder. So, uh, so just keep our new elders in your prayers. We'll tell you more about uh, um, who all those people are and what we're going to do with all of that as time goes on. But it's a great, great blessing to be able to um, make 12 new elders very, very soon. So let's stand together as we sing the hymn, We Are Called to Be God's People. No, we're not. We're going to sing the hymn that is on your order of service and not on my copy and paste from last week. Um, so one of the hymns in the purple hymn book we're going to sing just now, and it's going to come up on the screen behind us, and Rachel will play right tune, and off we go.
this small time of worship out into the world, into that place of worship. And so the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and all those who you love and all those you find it more difficult to love this day and forevermore.
salvation came, redeem a living Lord, who's conquering death forever, speaks God's favor, faith's reward. Your blessing rests on all whose eyes your body cannot see, yet who through faith in Christ in the Pentecostal 